It's time once again for Evolve Sales Live. Welcome back. I'm Jonathan Fisher. In business, as in any field, the ability to make solid decisions is at the very heart of leadership. But how can business leaders learn to make critical decisions quickly enough before opportunities or competitors can pass them by? Well, in today's show, you will learn key insights into better decision making, how to find the way forward when stuck at a crossroads, how to define what it even means to make good decisions, how to reset your mental framework so you can discern the way forward more effectively. In short, you'll learn how to make better decisions faster. Our guest today is the perfect man to help us with this. His name is Paul Epstein. Paul spent years as a highly successful sports executive leading the execution of billion-dollar NFL campaigns and generating league-leading sales results for multiple NBA teams. Paul moved on to become an independent consultant, advisor, and keynote speaker and is considered an expert in leadership development. Paul is also the author of the Amazon number one bestseller, The Power of Playing Offense. Paul Epstein, welcome to the show. What a thrill to have you with us today. Hey, Jonathan, fired up to be here. Yeah, and for our guest, hey, guess what? You just got a free upgrade to first <laughs> class. Uh, our other guest had a last-minute emergency, and uh, Paul's not only a fantastic expert, thought leader, and author, he's also a real super solid guy to step in last minute like this. So thanks, thanks on that front as well, Paul. Oh, anytime. So we have a fantastic topic to talk about today, um, how to make better decisions faster. And I know a lot of our uh, listeners are going to be business leaders at, at different levels, whether they're founders, mm -hmm. CEOs, whether they're business development officers. And that is such a critical key. Uh, talk to us about the insights you have to share. Like, how, how did you come to the insight you're going to be sharing with our audience here in just a minute uh, about making better decisions faster? Set it up for us, if you would. 100%. And, and actually, this is perfect timing because hot off the press, literally one week ago, I hit send on the official book manuscript titled Better Decision Faster. So it is now off in Publisherville. So this is, you want to talk somebody that's coming in hot. Uh, you know, when you write 50,000 words on something that you feel that you've got some level of expertise in, but more importantly, how is it portable and shareable with the world so that everybody that applies it can make better decisions faster. So the backstory, you mentioned the best-selling book, Leadership Playbook, The Power of Playing Offense. So that was spring of 2021. And inevitably, you dive into coaching, training, consulting. You host a podcast around it uh, called Playmakers. And you start to interview the who's who of who do you understand to be the people, the teams, the cultures, the organizations that play offense versus those that play defense. And what happens in the market as they're consuming and absorbing this playbook, the logical question becomes, Paul, can you just distill it down, curate the number one differentiator, the number one separator of those that play offense versus those that play defense? And there were themes. I, I, I call it the, the laboratory, if you will. I go back in the lab. And as I'm doing both qualitative and quantitative research, and again, just being a practitioner in my day-to-day -day operating role, wearing the hat set that I've already mentioned, and there were themes that started to emerge, themes of intentionality, themes of decisiveness, themes of massive action, however imperfect it may be. There were people that were always moving forward versus those that stay stuck on the sideline. They're paralyzed at those forks in the road. It's just littered with stress and anxiety and uh, decision fatigue and overwhelm. And so when I really put it on paper, I asked myself, well, action, whether to take action or not, in and of itself is a decision. So the lowest common denominator is decision making. That's the separator of those that play offense versus defense. But let's not just make any decisions. Let's be intentional in how we make those decisions. So I'll share today a process and a system that I call the head, heart, hands equation. And ultimately that's it. The head, heart, hands equation is the uh, framework, if you will, of how we can not only make better decisions, but let's make them faster. Framework and a process is exactly what I want to give the listener today. But I want to back up just a little bit further. Um, how are most leaders making decisions right now? And what <laughs> it would be, how's that missing the mark? Talk to us about that. It's very scattered. 
Uh, if you were to poll, interview, survey 100, 1,000, 10,000 people, what's your go-to process for making decisions? You're going to get a litany of answers. Uh, some people are going to rely more. Uh, so it's kind of that left brain, right brain, if you will. I think we all have a default setting and it's not bad. There is no better or worse. I'm not going to knock either side. I fall more on the emotion side. Other people fall heavily on the logic side. There's other people that are very much into gut and gut feel, which I, in the head, heart, hands model, where I really think about uh, head being your mindset, heart being your authenticity, and hands being action, I always get the question, so where does gut fit into that? And the answer is gut falls closest to heart. It's kind of that emotional piece. It's that uh, that feeling that you can't always describe, but there's a hunch and there's a knack, and the greater the life experience you have, the better at these gut decisions you have. So here's the beauty of it. When I call it the head, heart, hands equation, it's head plus heart equals hands. And so notice I said plus. There's two checkpoints. It's not one. So what I'm doing is if you're heavier in the head, you're a heavy logic person. With the equation, you cannot ignore your heart. You cannot ignore emotion. You cannot ignore feel because it's head plus heart. It's head and heart. And that gives you a signal for whether you should take action versus the inverse. For a guy like me, I'm a big emotion guy. I'm a big feeling guy. I lead from my heart, but the equation would force me to logically check in with my head and say, do I think this is a good idea? So that I don't just trip on myself and focus solely on feeling. So that think plus feel comes to do. That's the head plus heart equals hands. And here's the beauty of it. It is very much a, if I had to simplify it, imagine you're at a traffic signal and we all know that there's three possible variables. There's a green, there's a yellow, that's a red. Right. And so when I think about this head and heart, both on board, that's a green light to take action. One is on board. It's a yellow light. And you try to solve for the gap, either the head gap or the heart gap. And then when neither the head or the heart is on board, that's a red light. And so you ask me what the problems and the challenges are with decision making. For one, I think there's a lack of awareness and awareness is the core of EQ. We've all heard it. There's three layers of awareness, awareness of self, awareness of others, awareness of situation. They all matter. And then you layer on top of that emotional management. <laughs> and to me, that's a person that either has high EQ, mid EQ, low EQ. And so the table stakes and the, the gaps, if you will, of what I think leads to poor decision-making, A, lack of awareness, B, there's a, a gap in ownership, you know, like Jocko Willing wrote extreme ownership. And can you own not just the good and not just the, the right decisions, but can you own the bad? Can you own the controversy? Can you own the adversity? Can you own the setbacks? Can you own the hurdles and the obstacles? All of that, it's just character building 101. So I think leaning into that ownership piece of all of life is critical. And then the last one would be intention. How many folks are being intentional as they enter each day? Are they being mindful of how they show up? Are they tracing back to how they make decisions, how they take actions? And is there a process or a system? Or do they just go with how they're feeling in the moment? go with what they think to be true, go with what they think is going to be the crowd pleaser. Do they just want to surround their, their selves with yes people? Are they over indexing in the marketplace or on external circumstances? So you could see how much complexity is in this space of decision making. And that's why I wrote the book. I'm not trying to confuse people on the flip side. I'm trying to take something that has been overly complex and I'm trying to just create a very clear simple methodology and framework, head, heart, hand equation. And I believe that when we apply it, it's a life of more greens, head and heart fully on board. Now that we're conscious, we stop running reds. And most importantly, most of business and most of life lies in the yellow. Well, I'm writing a playbook on how we can navigate and conquer that messy middle of yellow. I love that. Well, and it really sounds like this this gap between the self awareness and the intentionality. It's probably more common than a lot of busy professionals would even 
be willing to admit, even to themselves, I would wonder. Like, you, you get in there, and you think you're on point, right? You <laughs> think you're caring about the right things. You're bringing some energy. You think you're bring, bringing your A game, but there's there's a gap there as well. I'm a little bit interested to bring that out as well. Are there some ways that I can know, hey, I'm, I think I'm in this, but maybe I'm going through the motions. What are some red flags that I might be looking at if I'm the listener? Yeah, and uh, so one, let's start from this place. Let's... A, I've got a fun fact, and I did not know this before doing all the research, uh, but the fun fact is going to lead to a little bit of what uh, unveils a, a response to your question there. So, Jonathan, this is the fun fact, and for everybody listening in, did you know that the average U.S. adult makes 35,000 decisions a day? What? You and I, every 35, person 000? listening in makes 35,000. Wow. Now- Let's think about this logically. The majority are, of course, on autopilot. I turn left in the driveway. I brush my teeth. I decide what gas to put in the car. Please, you do not need a head, heart, hands equation for those things. <laughs> right. But, but now let, <laughs> let's drill it. in. Yeah, yeah. That, no wonder there's paralysis <laughs> by analysis, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's a couple types of decisions from the big to the small. Let's start with, and by small, I don't mean by importance. I actually think it could be the inverse because the reality is we're not making mass critical decisions every single day. Some of us in higher stress, higher pressure environments believe that we are, but the reality is there are some days that there's not a life or death decision you're going to make. Um, mm -hmm. So two types of decisions. One is the moment by moment. And so the way I would think about that is mindset, energy, attitude, that comes back to the intentionality. That comes back to intentionality. Am I managing my energy in an intentional way? Mm -hmm. Hey, some really crappy thing happened in the morning, but I have an important meeting with an investor or founder in the afternoon. And so how do I dust myself off and show up at my best? That's going to take intentionality. That's going to yeah. take awareness. And so there are these small by size but big by impact decisions. Mm. Then when we zoom out, there is a smaller quantity of decisions we make in a day. So in sports, I have to use a bunch of sports metaphors because that is the world that I know. MVPs are most valuable players. I call these your MVDs, your most mm. valuable decisions. Mm. And those are those critical forks in the road strategy a or b time spent on x or y this is how you choose your priorities relationship am i in or out do i do the deal or not and you could see how is one of these decisions gonna make or break your business or life likely not however the compounding effect of being intentional about your mvds that is the separator between the business that will boom or bust the leader that is revealed versus loathed. All of these things have these massive, massive implications. So that's just a, a greater way of understanding that when I wrote the playbook, yes, it's for MVDs. It's also for how you're showing up each day because that's going to give you the clarity, confidence, and consistency, consistency that you need to be the best leader possible. The mental game, so critical. 100%. Well, I want to delve deeper into that in just a moment. First, a reminder to our live audience, hey, everybody, this is live for a good reason. We want you to participate. This is your chance to bring questions and get them answered right here, right now with our expert guest. So go ahead and start posting those, uh, posting those rather over in the chat. And uh, when we get to the bottom of the half hour here, we're going to veer over into some, some Q&A and uh, get you some great actionable insights. Also, it's worth mentioning, we are powered by a fantastic platform. One of the most important decisions any leader has to make is how to add to your team. You need to add to your team quickly, some really great professionals that can work from anywhere in the world, overpass.com. Go there, create a free account. You can get pre-vetted phone professionals to become SDRs, AEs, customer service reps, whatever you need. You can find them, interview them, and hire them in days instead of weeks. Check them out, overpass.com. So, Paul, going deeper on this, so the mental game that you had, you got some really great insights. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling that sports executive background uh, <laughs> definitely coming into the, into the fore here. Do you have some stories where some of the leaders you've worked with or maybe in your own experience you've been able to apply some of the insights to kind of set it up? And then we're going to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of how uh, the listener can begin to act on these. 
Yeah. So here's the beauty I'll share not only about a couple of other leaders, but even looking in the mirror, which I believe can be the greatest uh, teacher of them all, especially when we're learning or willing to learn from the bad, the things that didn't go our way. And so I reflect back on sports and, you know, there, there's folks that I would consider to be phenomenal decision makers, phenomenal action takers, phenomenal leaders, and they usually fall in a similar bucket. And then there's quite the opposite. And just like a relationship, uh, I always joke that you got to date some crazy to find the one. <laughs> and that's why, you know, early in your career, you work for a couple of bad companies, bad leaders, bad cultures, but it teaches you what not to do. And then eventually you find the good side and you're like, oh, let me hang out in this new space. And so a couple of stories that come to mind yeah. because my biggest decision personally was taking the Jerry Maguire like leap out of sports. People mm -hmm. thought it was massively courageous. People think that I'm this massive risk taker, but the reality is it was on the heels of me doing some internal work. I found my why at a leadership offsite retreat when I was head of sales for the San Francisco 49ers. And that internal look, that understanding of knowing who I am, knowing my why, knowing my values and using those as anchors and as filters to drive my daily decisions and actions. That's how I started to be the practitioner of like, why am I credible to speak on decision-making and action taking mm -hmm. a, just like most people, I've made a ton of bad decisions and I'll own that. But I also have made life-changing positive decisions. So now I get to study what do those decisions have in common? And that's what started to inform the head, hard hands equation. That's where I say, oh, the ones that worked out were green lights. Hmm. My head and my heart were a hell yes. Hmm. Oh, those things that derailed, almost derailed my career, those things that took me years to recover from, I was running red lights. I was not checking in with my head and my heart. And then where I'll share with other folks more external stories, because I think these are A, the most life-changing and impactful, and B, I think green and red are pretty much an awareness game. Hmm. You can read the playbook. You could read a blog post of mine after I get a lot of better decisions, faster content out in 2023. Once you know what a green light is and what a red light is, you're going to attack more of the first. You're going to populate your life and business with more of the first, and you're going to stop running the second. More greens, less reds. That's the game plan. And you probably don't need me in your corner the rest of your life for greens and reds, but the yellow that's the tricky part when either your head or heart is not on board. So a couple of examples, one I'll share is, so imagine this, you're, you have a leadership audience, a lot in the tech space and a lot of uh, folks that are in charge of personnel. They're in charge of hiring and firing. And in my case, I've probably hired, recruited, onboarded thousands of people over the course of my career. Some decisions on talent were phenomenal. Others were the exact opposite and a ton fell in between. So you start to study that. I, when I led sales teams and I think of other leaders and other uh, hires of talent, think of that person that was an ultra high performer. They were an ultra high producer, but, and you probably already know where I'm going with this. They were toxic in the locker room. Mm. Their energy, their attitude, just somebody that you did not love being around, but they sold the most widgets or they were the best at their craft. And so the head, hard hands equation, this is a yellow light because your head says, keep them on board because of their production and performance. But your heart says, this is not a person that I want to be in my company or on my team for the years to come. Like if they were on my team in five or 10 years, it's almost a depressing thought but you still keep them around. Why? It's a scarcity mindset. It's thinking you can't replace them with somebody that could be a green light. Hmm. So where I really think this yellow comes in is if you hang out too long where your head is on board and convinces you uh, because of money or whatever other factors come in, but your heart knows that they're not the right one, that long-term yellow is just as deadly as a red. Hmm. A long-term yellow where your head is in hmm. and your heart will not change. It's not. This person's hmm. not going to magically be different tomorrow, nor are you going to change your heart by tomorrow. A long-term yellow is just as deadly as a red. That's hmm. one insight. Flip it. What if your heart was on board, but your head is not? So again, I, let's, let's say we have some entrepreneurs listening in right now. We got a lot of founders and we always hear the word of mission. 
You yeah. don't start a company. I would argue that any single person entering the gates of Shark Tank, there is a deeper purpose. There is a deeper mission. They were mad about the mousetrap of yesterday, so they created their own for today. Their heart is all in, but maybe, man, this thing hasn't taken off. So maybe the head gap is purely financial. I know many folks that they pour their soul into a nonprofit venture or to a cause or a philanthropy. But again, there's just this hurdle and usually the hurdles in the head. And for that type of a yellow, what I have seen from other leaders is that's the good yellow. The opposite mm. is very deadly. I already mentioned that. The hard on board yellow, you stay in that fight. You stay in the fight because purpose the deeper mission is the cornerstone of resilience. When you get knocked down, when all of these hurdles and setbacks and inevitable adversities hit you, the reason you get up off the mat is because you give a damn, because there's deeper purpose, there's deeper meaning, you believe in the impact, you wanna make a difference, you wanna leave people in places better than you found them, so you stay in that fight because your head can be improved. Maybe there's a limiting belief that's getting in the way. Maybe you need to talk to a coach or a mentor. Maybe there's an advisor that can logically kind of help you improve the situation. But the hard part, you already got your head's in. So that's the good yellow. And that's the yellow where I have seen others when they stay in the fight, that yellow ends up turning into a green. I think that's so powerful because many times when we feel that ambiguity, we read it as just a one category of a, of a thing. And we just put it in the same bucket for kind of like later consideration, I think is what we may, we, we kind of do. We compartmentalize that in a, in a different box. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is they don't all belong in the same box. If you're ambiguous about this set of factors, you can't ignore that. This set of factors, uh, make sure that you take a decisive action on, uh, you know, either way, I guess is what you're saying, but do, do so appropriately. Um, the ambiguity of decisions, you're calling that yellow. I like that. I like this you know, green light, yeah. red light, yellow light uh, methodology or, or a rubric that you're using. Mm -hmm. So when you're on a yellow kind of decision, what if it's in the middle somewhere? Like, what if you actually aren't really sure? Like, are you, because sometimes we fool ourselves. Like, we think we really care about a thing. Uh -huh. But, you know, I could come at it from the opposite side and say, well, I'm not, if I'm not taking action on it, am I, do I, do I really have a passion for that? Like, what's going on there? Yeah, that I, I love this. Thank you for bringing this up. Um, I'm gonna get to that in two seconds, but where I where I believe that we land is this, because I I speak a lot about purpose and how it ties back to this is I think that's too big of a place to start. So what I tell people to do is they reverse engineer it. Don't start at the north star. That's too big. I'm the win Monday guy. <laughs> mm. I'm the win one day, one decision, one action at a time. Make things portable that folks can win, create progress and momentum. So where it answers your question is this, if we don't start a purpose, then where do we start? Well, what's before purpose? Purpose, uh, before that, you find something that you're passionate about. I don't really even know what I'm passionate about. Okay, what's before passion? And here's what answers your question, curiosity. So if you took it now in the, the logical order, curiosity sparks passion, can unearth purpose, but it's in that order. You don't start at purpose. You start with curiosity. So if I'm in my early twenties, I'm deciding, Hey, I, I got to experiment in the job field because I want to figure out what career path I want to, or I want to figure out what I'm called into. Let's start at the lowest common denominator. And so to your point, sometimes it, there's not a clear green, yellow, or red. Sometimes you just don't know. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then uh, you can handle it one of two ways. I think in my case where you say, well, you got to take on some jobs to figure out what the right ladder to climb is. Mm. And then once you climb a ladder, you got to ask yourself, is it leaning against the right wall? <laughs> mm. You know, so that's going to take some experimentation. That's going to take some swings and misses. But when you hit, you also have to be aware enough to step into that. Yeah. Versus I do think that, okay, here's a good analogy. All of us have probably gone through some think tank type exercise where we put 50 post-its up on the wall. It's end of right now, end of year planning. And what should we prioritize for next year? And there's 50 yeah. possible things. And so with my framework, I would tell you to get to a green, yellow, or red, only move forward with the greens, peel and, and just trash the reds. But, yeah. but the yellows, the other approach is this. Sometimes you're in a position where you can hold off on the yellows but other times you need to step into them. So I just think that's where awareness comes in. And I would say, if you can create a situation for yourself where you can identify a green and do that in lieu of a yellow, then you can just truly, the decision 
is not to make the decision. Hmm. So indecision can be intentional. I think when indecision is accidental or when it's caused by paralysis, that's a difference. I'm hmm. not paralyzed by that post-it. I'm saying, no, I can fill my 365 calendar or we have enough cooking in our lab. We have enough cooking in our company. We don't need to tackle those yellows. That's intentional de decision making to not move forward. So that's kind of how I would break that down is okay. some things you do need to move into curiosity and experimentation and others you can be on the sidelines and just say, like, here's a real example for me. All my business and thought leadership right now is primarily to a B2B audience. Awesome. Well, guess what? I'm a uh, proud father of a soon to be two year old. And so the more and more that he's knowing what's going on in the world, trust me, there will be books in my future. I will write books <laughs> for kids. I will develop the leaders of tomorrow, not just today. Am I doing that tomorrow? No. Am I going to do it? Hell yes. When am I going to do it? I don't know. It's just on my roadmap. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. it. I've made the decision, but I'm being intentional that tomorrow is not the right time for action. I love that. Well, let's see if we can't recap then. So if I'm a listener and I want to really begin to implement on this, I love, I love the overall framework you've laid out. Give me the process now in a recap fashion, one, two, three steps. What do I do? The way we make better decisions faster is we apply the head, heart, hands equation to define them. Head is mindset, heart is authenticity, hands are action. So when you're deciding whether to take action or not, there's one of three outcomes, just like a traffic light, green, yellow, and red. When your head and heart are on board, that's a green light, take action. When only one is on board, that's a yellow light, you try to solve for the gap. If neither your head nor your heart is on board, that is a red light, you should not take action. So at those critical forks in the road, at those sometimes paralyzing forks in the road, you now have a framework that within seconds or minutes can get you to a green, yellow, or red. And that's via the head, hard hands equation. Love it. Great stuff. Well, I know that the listener is going to want to take this conversation further. And uh, Paul, you've got several really neat ways that uh, folks can do just that. Talk to us a little bit about what you've got on tap for us. Yeah, well, the cool thing is, so while the book will be launching uh, Q2, Q3 of this coming year, what I wanted to say is there's a couple of precursors to it because how could we possibly make better decisions faster if we didn't have clarity and have confidence? And so with my partners at the Y Institute, this was an assessment that was a life changer for me. I've now been sharing it with the world, and this is a free gift for all of your listeners. So I know we'll put this in the show notes, but I wanted a gift to everybody listening in, uh, a complimentary Y assessment. It's a five-minute tool, and it helps you know who you are. It helps you know how you think, how you operate. It helps you be a more effective decision maker because now you have that clarity and you can be more confident and at the end of the road, we're better decision makers. So whyinstitute.com backslash purpose is the URL. I know it's up here right now as well, uh, but that would be a gift that I just wanted to share with the world. And of course, any opportunity to connect, paulepsteinspeaks.com, best way to find me. You can find more info on the book there, all that good stuff. Well, great stuff, Paul. You've got a really neat uh, angle on things coming from that sports background. I know a lot of uh, a lot of us can identify with that. Uh, there's a lot of commonality between the elements of, of success in both worlds, business and sports. That is for sure. Well, we want to go ahead and get into Q and A. We've got some questions yeah, to get answered it. on tap and uh, keep them coming, audience members. Um, let me see if we can't pick a couple here. Um, so here's one for you from Dennis. He's asking. You know, I'm about to train five people next week in a new initiative. What are the top three things I should make sure are ingrained? So this is a, a way to apply through one's team. Great question. Yeah, great question. So first of all, I'll leverage the head, hard hands equation as a potential uh, thing that you can ingrain there. But but then I'll kind of zoom out. And also, can we leave the question up? It'd be great. That way I can uh, come back to it as well. So I would say this. What is the why of the... Uh, training session. And so, you know, oftentimes, like, so as a sales guy myself, and when I was from an entry to executive level in pro sports, I used to just train solely the what or the how. And then I started to realize when we're not clear on the why, so why are we stepping into this training session? Mm -hmm. And also, 
Who are the people in the room? What are they motivated by? Now I can speak their language. And that's why this why assessment is so key. I literally share with everybody I work with from a, from a client side to a team member side because it helps me know how they're wired. And so rather than just train all five people in the same way, sure, if we're just going to teach them the blocking and tackling of the tactics, that's fine. But you also need to understand that a lot of the problems that we have in the workforce right now, so zoom out uh, a couple of years back, you had this great resignation. Now, even worse than that, you got quiet quitting. And mm -hmm. we've we've had for 30 years, we've had disengagement challenges that one out of three people really cares about what they do. Two out of three people don't. And so literally we're getting 20, 30, 40 percent of that person. They don't even really want to be there, but we ignore that. And then we train them in whatever it is. And there's no stickiness. There's no staying power. It's paycheck over purpose. So I guess what I'm saying is not to diminish whatever we're going to train folks in, but we have to understand who's in our locker room. And that's where we need to know their why. We need to know their personal and professional motivations. And then we customize and we tailor our language so now we can connect on a deeper level. And if they were, for whatever reason, disengaged, now you can be that ambassador that gets them back to the engaged side. Love that. Um, here's actually another good question coming to us from Joshua. What, what do you think is the best way to support your salespeople and teams to grow professionally? I mean, at the end of the yeah. day, you know, leadership traits are traits that all professionals need. Love it. For one, I would say focus on the whole person especially in a quantitative area of business like sales, where there's always a scoreboard. And that's the home that I've had for a long period of time. I think back to folks that I would do anything for versus folks that if they paid me enough, then I would do something. And, and there's a massive gap in between that. And the difference is that second person that I wouldn't do anything for, it was an exchange of services. It was, it, it, there was uh, the income, and production. And it was kind of this back and forth volley because I knew that they looked at me as a producer and that was it. But then there were other leaders that looked at me as Paul, the whole person, the relationship. They cared about me beyond work. They delivered the feedback that I needed to hear, didn't always want to hear. And so what I would say is help them grow as people Bake professional stuff into it. But if you were to do a, a session on mindset, if you were to do a session and bring in uh, different types of thought leadership, more than just sales and selling widgets, it's all about how can you help the whole holistic person? Because I, I think of this as work-life balance is a fallacy. It's a myth. I believe in work-life integration especially in the last couple of years, work and life are fully integrated and we're lying to ourselves if we think differently. And so the reality is how can you help them in other areas of their life? And so, you know, a good example is, um, one of my buddies, his name is Greg Scheinman. He has a cohort of coaching that he calls it the midlife male and he works with many other folks, but he calls it the six F's. And so from family to finance, to fun, to food, to fitness, and that may sound like it has nothing to do with business, but the reality is the person that's getting help in all of these different areas is going to have higher well-being. Higher well-being leads to higher engagement, higher engagement leads to more production, and this isn't some manipulative game of let me pretend to care about the whole person so that they can produce more. No, this is, mm. I genuinely care about the person. And so I'm going to train them in areas that are outside of the functional part, because now that's how we build a bridge. And that's how there's loyalty and commitment, which frankly is a gap in the workplace. So you can be the outlier when you actually care about the whole person. Yeah. I mean, now do you, I'll, I'll ask a follow up question to that. Yeah. Do you, do you feel that's obviously a challenge we need to take on? I think people are definitely hungry for authenticity. Yeah. Uh, we live the more so now that we are being geographically separated by circumstances, you know, we're, we're hungry for connection. It's just a very, it's a basic human need. Um, and we want to have some relevance that has something to do with people in our lives. So th there's a lot going on there. Is there some peril for the leader who wants to take that challenge on? Can you kind of get into something equivalent to the friend zone where it can also, mm. it can all, almost be di become difficult to then now call for accountability? Like it, where is that balancing point? What yeah. do you say to that? Great question. And let's be very direct here. Uh, a specific is probably a better word. 
friend zone would mean that all we focused on was build a relationship, build a relationship, build a relationship. And it's a lot of hugs and kisses and all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> what I'm suggesting is, yeah, sure. Look, build a relationship, you know, have a beverage if that's your style, like do the stuff that like you would nor that, you know, they like to do. And if you like to do it game on awesome, mm. but I'm not saying to go all in on that as an example, you, um, if, if somebody, all right, if I knew that somebody, uh, maybe I, I manage a young sales team and maybe half of them are uh, not, uh, financial literacy is not a strength, you know, like they could use a little bit of, so, Hey, what if I had a client, what if I had a mentor that was a wealth manager? And what if I brought him or her into the office just to share 60 minutes of practical ways that we can better manage our money and our wealth to accumulate a more wealthy lifestyle. If that was the case, I'm not giving them hugs and kisses. I'm giving them access to resources. That has nothing to do with friend zone. I'm just adding value to their life in ways that I know would be meaningful to them. And, or if I know, uh, that, Hey, you know what? We, we work so much, we're sitting around and our physical health is falling apart. What if I created, instead of team building, being a night out at the bar, it could be something that was, and you know, you did a boot camp experience and you say, Hey folks, it's really important that because kind of the Dallas Cowboys uh, philosophy, the uh, Deion Sanders, it was when he said, when you feel good, you play good. And when you play good, they pay good. So focus <laughs> on that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I'm giving some examples that are a little scattered because I want folks to know that you need to speak their language, not what's most important to you. It's what's most important to them. And so know where the desires are. Ask them, ask mm -hmm. them and customize the approach. And that has nothing to do with being their friend. Um, and the last thing I'll share is feedback. Mm -hmm. If you care about people, and this actually goes against the friend zone, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to tell them, I said this earlier, what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. Everybody on this call right now, we've heard in a performance review, we've likely heard the exact same thing from two different people, but one you knew cared about you as a whole person, the other one you knew did not And mm -hmm. they say the exact same words. And with the first person, you're going to say, man, that, that was, that was tough. Thanks for telling me, but like, man, let me go dust myself off. Like that was not a, a pretty conversation, but thank you for telling me the hard truth. Mm -hmm. I need to get better. Versus the second person, what an a-hole. They said the exact same words, but you know, they don't care about you. So yeah. it's really, it's giving that hard truth in the words of Kim Scott, the radical candor. And I think that can be a phenomenal principle to lead by. Yeah, I love that. Uh, a good follow on, maybe you can add a few, a little extra color to the same issue. Uh, Lady Popak is asking, how could basically, how can you reduce churn, right? What are some ways you can make certain that your team feels like they have a home for a long-term career? Yeah, a lot of this stuff is integrated. So I'll 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 give a a diverse answer. All the stuff that I've shared in the past five, 10 minutes, though, are ways you can reduce turnover though. Because mm -hmm. what what I will say is this: besides the, I mean, look, there, there's gonna be some folks that look at things very logically and they would leave a nine dollar job for ten dollars, they would leave 10 for eleven. So I, there's no need for me to comment on that. I'd focus more on the human side and the people side of things that are controllable because maybe we have constraints on things like what I just described. But what people are really lacking right now is a lack of belonging. They don't feel they belong in the team, the company, the culture. There's no tribal effect. And so I would just toss it back to you to say that what would make you feel like you belonged and whatever you think would draw you in and create that stickiness and commitment and loyalty and reduce turnover. And the same things that will reduce turnover, by the way, are also great recruiting tools. Mm. So what works to attract talent works to currently engage talent works to retain talent. It's all the same stuff. I'll leave with one other thought as well. I think this is a really cool one and everybody should go through this exercise. Think of the greatest leader that you've ever had in any walk of life. It could be a parent, it could be a coach, it could be a mentor, it could be somebody in business, whomever. Think of that person. And then ask yourself, what did they do? 
What were their actions? What were their behaviors? And imagine I'm at a flip chart here. We're doing a training workshop and I ask you for one or two res word responses. So you say things like they listened, they cared, they had compassion, they challenged, they inspired, hmm. they, and you just keep rattling them off. But go through that exercise and write down 10, 20, 30 words hmm. of what that greatest leader did. And if you get stuck on one person, go to the next greatest leader, go to the next greatest leader until you get 20 or 30 words and mark my words. That is your job description. If you want hmm. to stop losing talent, if you want to inspire teams, if you want to take your culture from here to there, then we have to act and show up as the greatest leader that we've ever had. Because when I ask somebody else that question in five or 10 years, you want them to think of you. And when you do those things, when you listen with empathy, by the way, top five answer, 90% of the time I've asked this to over 10,000 people in workshops, listening is the most common response that finishes in the top five words every single time. Like it is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. My theory is, it's so rarely practiced and so sought after. Hmm. So if everyone in the world was a great empathetic listener, it wouldn't be in the top five, but it feels hmm. so good to be listened to and yeah. seen and validated and heard and recognized. Hmm. But most people don't feel that. And therefore they don't feel like they belong. And therefore they quietly quit or therefore they're disengaged or therefore they, you see where I'm going with this. All of this stuff is connected, but I can't, I don't have a wand for the great resignation. I don't have a wand for quiet quitting. I have a wand to act as the greatest leader that I've ever had in my own unique, authentic way. And your problems will largely diminish or go away if you're consistent with those behaviors. I love it. Well, one final question. There's been yeah. lots of golden nuggets you're dropping here, Paul. I'm really grateful for that. We have a great question from Lydell. I don't want to miss out on this one. He, he's asking, it's a good question to ask because it's easy to talk about these things as though we're all a bunch of, uh, I don't know, Vulcans like Mr. Spock and we're just you know looking at this analytically. It, this is an emotional game. I mean, business is tremendously emotional. And when you, you feel like you're doing the best you know and you're working your plan, and, and the plan doesn't seem to be working well, it can get under the skin of a leader. And this is even at high levels. You talk to people behind the scenes, they don't often admit this. Can you share an insight? How do you break loose? You shared earlier how important mindset is. Um, what's a way to break loose when it feels like you're just kind of getting under a little bit as a founder or leader? Yeah, well, there's a great question. I would I would get clear on why the idea is in these words, not being executed successfully. And here's kind of the, we could answer that in 20 different ways. So let me isolate it to one thing. And this comes back to ownership because it's so easy when something doesn't work out to point a finger. It's so easy to your point to have that negative emotion. And we're all human, by the way, guilty. I'm not pointing, I'm not deflecting here. I'm not saying that I am innocent in this space. I too have had these negative emotions. And of course, we've all been a part of many things that were not executed successfully. And here's what I've noticed. Whether it was truly on me or if it was more on my team, and that, what I do know is this, 99.9% .9 of the time when I pass the book, when I put fault on somebody else, if I play the victim card, if I say, woe is me, if I, anything that lives outside of me that I get negative about, it has served me in horrible ways in the long run. Like it, it damages relationships. Sometimes it leads to me not being at a place or welcomed at a place anymore. Sometimes I lose that political capital inside of an organization, whatever the negative outcome is, most importantly, it's fractured relationships, which I hate doing. And that's the regret I have because I tried to put it on somebody else or I blame the market or I blame these external circumstances versus when I owned it. Hmm. I've been passed up. Here's a real thing. Like uh, one of the toughest parts, I, I detail this in my book, The Power of Playing Offense. It was this time where I, I knew that I was ready for that first senior level role that I was being looked at for. And inevitably the organization went a different direction and I'm leaving out a lot of color because of time, but it was the biggest gut punch that I ever received. And the person that got it, I was like, oh my gosh, I know that's not the right decision. <laughs> like it's, I, I'm saying this years later. And as much as I wanted to pass the buck and even my better half, she told me basically burn the bridges and burn mm. the boats. <laughs> but I, stepped into it. And for some reason I took the high road. 
Hmm. And I asked myself, instead of just this pity party or this F you to the who, I, none of that. I asked myself, how can I get better? I was obviously passed up for a reason, whether fair or not fair, whether political or not, whether hmm. I don't know. And even if I ask, I'm not sure I would believe the answer. But what I can do is change myself. I can become a better version of me. I can ask myself what my weaknesses are. I can make sure that my C's turn into B's and my B's turn into A's or my A's turn into A pluses through intentional work and personal and professional development. So I just went into a personal and professional development laboratory to work on myself. And that here's how you get rid of negative emotions. I'll give attributes and credit to Ed Milet, who's a thought leader that I love and follow. He says, it is impossible to feel helpless when you become helpful. Hmm. It is impossible to feel helpless when you become helpful. So instead of the pity party, I started to help myself and I started to help other people and I started to just do things. And logically it probably made no sense, but hmm. that's how I stepped into it. So I hope that that can be helpful insight for everybody listening in. I love it. And you've been acting on that by helping us today on the program. Paul Epstein, thanks so much for being such a fantastic guest, helping us learn how to make better decisions faster. Yeah, thank you so much, Jonathan. And uh, thank you to our audience. Without you, the show couldn't even happen. You've made us such a success. Keep it up. Bring your friends, guests, come back and see us each Friday afternoon at the same time. And if you're listening during the holiday season, hey, have a great holiday time with friends, family, people important to you. Go make it count. Spend time making memories together. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time.